Welcome back Autobots, Decepticons, and everything in between to another Transformers theory. Today's is going to cover how Scorponok showed up in Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. But before we get into that, a quick word from our sponsor, Magic Spoon. Do you love cereal but dislike the fact that it's stuffed with endless amounts of sugar? Well, I'm proud to present to you Magic Spoon, the one and only cereal for all ages that tastes delicious while being very healthy. Magic Spoon cereals have 0 grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, Protein, and only 4 net grams of carbs in each serving, with its total calorie count only being 140 calories per serving. Magic Spoon comes in a variety of flavors, such as fruity, blueberry, cocoa, cinnamon, honeygram, and my all-time personal favorite, maple waffle. Now this one tastes as good as it smells. I seriously recommend this one since out of all the wonderful flavors Magic Spoon sent me, this one truly ranks supreme. So if you are interested in trying out Magic Spoon, click the link in the description to grab a variety variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use the promo code TRANCE at checkout to get $5 off any order, or go to magicspoon.com slash trance. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money back, no questions asked. So click the link in the description below and use code TRANCE for $5 off. Or go to magicspoon.com slash trance to save $5 today. Now for those of you who may not remember, Scorponok was Blackout's minicon partner in Transformers 2007. During Blackout's attack on the US SOC sent forward operations base in Qatar, Scorponok was deployed to seek out and destroy an escaped unit of soldiers under the command of Captain Lennox. After spying on them for some time, Scorponok fatally impaled Sergeant Patrick Donnelly, and chased the soldiers to a nearby village where he would send a barrage of missiles at them. However, when Sergeant Epps called in his AC-130 killstreak, Scorponok was too weak to keep on fighting and decided to bail. He wouldn't be seen again up until Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. During the battle in Egypt between the Autobots and the Decepticons, Scorponok jumped out of the sand when Jetfire was finishing off the Mixmaster clone, catching the Ancient Seeker off guard and severely wounding him. However, Scorponok did not live long enough to savor his success, since Jetfire managed to crush his head in with his fist, killing the Scorpion once and for all. Though Scorponok's inclusion in Revenge of the Fallen was very cool, it really doesn't make much sense, since the last time we saw Scorponok was during the final battle in Los Angeles, and not in the way you may expect. You see, Blackout is unable to transform without Scorponok. That's because Scorponok makes part of Blackout Sikorsky MH-53 vehicle mode, since he transforms into one of his T-64 turboshaft engines, along with various other parts of the chopper. And if you don't believe me, take a look at this clip from the Special Features DVD of Transformers 2007. I, I wanted to have the, the, the notion of these components from the Sea Stallion helicopter, which is basically what he is birthed from. So he has these kind of Sea Stallion helicopter components to him, and the turbines for his hands, and I wanted to see how these things could turn, and how that he could dig in, and then shoot the sand out. Now, you may be wondering why we didn't see Scorponok attached to his back during the final battle, since before he deployed him in Qatar, we could partly see his tail on Blackout's back. Now, though there is no official answer to this, I think the reason why we saw his tail there and not here is because during the raid on Qatar, Blackout had Scorponok on standby in case he needed to swiftly deploy him in order to take out any fleeing soldiers who could potentially alert the government of their existence, which is ultimately what he ended up doing. However, during the final battle, Blackout didn't need to worry about that happening, since at that point, the government knew of their existence. Another question you may have is why Blackout did not deploy Scorponok when he was being attacked by Lennox and his crew. And well, if you think about it, Blackout was more than capable of taking them out on his own since he was able to kill hundreds of military personnel with ease. He never got the chance to finish off Lennox's ragtag team since he was caught off guard by the missiles from the F-22s which ultimately killed him. In addition to that, Scorponok is only useful when he's in an environment that is open and has a lot of sand. And LA is <laughs> the polar opposite of that. Among other things, the way he deploys could be fatal if he doesn't land in anything other than sand or water, since a swan dive into solid concrete could easily lead to death. So with all that squared off, we still don't know exactly how Scorponok got to Egypt. 
However, the last time we see Blackout's body gives us a clue. The last time we see him is when the military is dumping Megatron's body into the ocean. However, if you look at Blackout's body, it has been disassembled with several pieces missing. The same scenario goes for Megatron as well, but he is only missing an arm and a leg. Now, you may be wondering why this is important. And that's because Scorponok's last known location was inside of Blackout. So depending on where Blackout was dismantled, we can figure out where Scorponok ended up. A common theory is that Sector 7 were the ones responsible for dismantling the cons. But we know this isn't the case since after the battle in LA, President Bush ordered the termination of Sector 7, and for the remains of the dead aliens disposed of in the Laurentian Abyss. So with that said, it wasn't them. However, we do know that sometime after the Battle of LA, the Non-Biological Extraterrestrial Species Treaty, also known as NEST, was set up under William Lennox to create a combined human Autobot defense force against Decepticons. And since they were the only organization at this time that was familiar with Cybertronians and their technology, I think it would be safe to say that Nest were the ones responsible for the dismantling. So based upon that, we can confidently say that Scorponok ended up at Nest, since Blackout's body was dismantled there. But now the question is how did he exactly get out of Blackout? But to answer that, we need to find out why Scorponok did not eject out of Blackout when he died. The best possible explanation that I could think of is due to the immense trauma Blackout's body took. It puts Scorponok into Stasis Lock, which is a sort of coma that allows a Transformer to survive, running at the lowest level of power despite massive energy loss or traumatic damage. This scenario happened to Optimus Prime in Transformers Age of Extinction. After an encounter with Lockdown and Cemetery Wind in Mexico City, Optimus Prime went into Stasis Lock in order to heal himself. He was only broken out of it when Cade Yeager tampered with his internal mechanics causing him to be reactivated. I think when the Nest soldiers were dismantling Blackout, the vibrations of the machinery caused Scorponok to be reactivated, causing him to dig his way out of Blackout's body. This could also serve as an explanation to why Blackout's body was more torn up than Megatron's, since Scorponok burrowed his way out of it. However, I think he would end up being captured shortly after this incident, and I have evidence to back this up. In Revenge of the Fallen, Nest was able to make the twins transform in a weird way, where this electricity morphed them between modes. I think this was a result of Nest experimenting with the concept of making two Cybertronians transform into one vehicle, hence why the twins were merged together as an ice cream truck. The reason why Nest would go on to give them two separate vehicle modes is because this experiment failed when the twins separated when trying to chase sideways. However, I think the reason why Nest was able to pull this off is because they studied Scorponok's unique ability of being able to transform into part of Blackout's vehicle mode and wanted to replicate the unique ability of two Transformers becoming one vehicle for themselves. And this isn't the first time Scorponok has been studied, since in the 07 film, Lennox and his crew studied Scorponok's tail and found out what ammunition did the most damage to Cybertronians, leading them to have a fighting chance against the Decepticons. Look at the scorch mark where the Sabo round hit. It's melted right through. Hey, aren't Sabos hot loaded for like a 6,000 degree magnesium burn? Close to it. It melts tank armor. This metal skin must react to extreme heat. All right, get on the horn with Northern Command. Tell them our effective weapon is high heat sable rounds. Recommend we load them on all the gunships. Go. Though this could be a bit of a stretch. In hindsight, I think it would be the best explanation on why the twins were able to transform in this way, since this version of transformation doesn't have any explanation whatsoever, and only appears in this one scene and nowhere else in the entire saga. Another piece of evidence to prove that Scorponok was captured by Nest is by the fact that Soundwave already knows the location location of the Nest base. You see, in Revenge of the Fallen, Soundwave is able to connect to a US military satellite and instantly eavesdrop on what everyone is saying at Nest. This is how he found the Shard's location, which he proudly messages to the other Decepticons. However, at no point did Soundwave state that he learned where the Autobot base was, which leads me to believe that he learned of it sometime before the events of Revenge of the Fallen. This further seems to be the case since he's able to send Ravage there without a second thought. The most logical way Soundwave likely learned of Nest's location would be by scanning the Earth for Decepticon life signals. He would eventually pick up Scorponok's life signature and would likely wonder how he could possibly make it to the island of Diego Garcia all on his own. This would prompt Soundwave to do some digging where he would eventually find out that this island was where Nest was stationed and served as the Autobot base. So with all that said, I think it is safe to say that Scorponok was captured at Nest. But now you may be wondering how this explains him getting to Egypt. 
And well, as we know, the Nesta base is located in Diego Garcia, which is only 5,870 kilometers from Egypt. Meaning, if Skorpionok would escape, he could easily swim there, likely taking a route through Yemen or Somalia in order to make it to Egypt. And, as we know, Transformers are waterproof, so this wouldn't pose an issue for Scorponok. But what makes this even more plausible is that he has turbines for hands, meaning that he could easily propel himself through the water just like he does with sand. So with that said, now the question is how did he escape? And, well, this could have a multitude of explanations, but since Scorponok would easily be under heavy surveillance at Nest, I think the best explanation on how he would escape would be through Soundwave orchestrating a rescue mission for him. Similar to how he sent Ravage and Reedman to retrieve the Shard, I think he sent them to bust Scorponok out. And I may have some evidence for this since during the Shard heist, Ravage and Reedman were able to steal the Shard in mere minutes. Both of them knew where to be and what to do every step of the way. Based upon their efficiency that day, I think it is safe to assume that they performed a similar operation in the past that operation being busting Scorponok out. As for how this operation went down is anyone's guess, but in the end we do know the con succeeded since Scorponok was able to make it to the final battle to have his epic showdown with Jetfire. And just like that, that was how Scorponok appeared in Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you have not already, check out the Fixing Transformers playlist for some more awesome theories. But before I go, I want to say thank you to all my Patreons and channel members for supporting the channel. Thanks to you guys, Trans Theories is where it is today, so thank you. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, consider dropping a like rating because it does help the channel a lot. With that said, keep on theorizing.